Good evening, everyone. I have begun the recording. I want to double check. Yes. Uh, welcome to our fourth session uh, of virtual family orientation. And um, for today, we'll kind of start the same way as we always do. We'll um, be able to talk about the 17th a little bit. And I also want to share a link to Facebook page where uh, we invite our families to um, join. It has a couple of questions. Uh, I only bring in and accept the families that have provided answers to those questions because it's hard for me to otherwise um, include those who might not belong in the group. It's a closed group for families. So please answer the two questions. What is your cadet's name and what is their major? And um, the purpose of that uh, web uh, or for, for that uh, Keelhaller family page on Facebook is to stay connected with uh, the campus. I often put updates and also uh, photos of students that I take while I'm um, going from one end of the campus to another to get a chance to see what your student might be doing at that given point on that day. Uh, I'll share that in chat shortly. Um, welcome again. We have a financial aid with us today and student financials. We also have um, a member of our admissions team joining us and uh, I will be requesting Larry in just a few minutes to go first so he can make a plug for uh, some um, outstanding items from students uh, and maybe you can help him uh, work with your students and help him get those pieces of information. Um, so we'll get to Larry in just a minute. But before that, um, 17th uh, is inching along and we're getting closer to it. Uh, you will be receiving an email from our housing folks, um, not you, your student will be receiving a time when you uh, are expected to arrive on campus. You will park in lot O and uh, come into PIAC. Your students will pick up uniforms from um, a designated spot. You will have an opportunity to meet some of us again in person. Um, they'll pick up their stuff. You'll go back to your car, put the new uniforms in there and head to your designated res hall. Once you're there, um, the person driving, sadly, will have to remain in the car and drive out of that um, space, but everyone else in the car and the belongings will uh, come out. And we'll have lots of students who are um, eager and ready and excited to help you get to your room. I was informed by my colleague, Tim, who you will be meeting soon um, at, at another Zoom. Uh, he said the total time it was, uh, or average time it took for students and their families to get fully brought into their room was 38 seconds. So there's lots of help and they're very efficient. They'll get you to your room and you'll be able to do whatever it is that you wish to do with your student there. Um, get situated, decorate, um, please remind them to try their uniforms. Um, and if anything doesn't fit like they expected, uh, hold on to that piece and you will be able to exchange it for a better fitting piece later that evening from 4.30 to 6. Or I'm sorry, 4 to 6.30 uh, back in the in PIAC before you head out to dinner or shortly bef uh, before the floor meetings start. Um, there will be a window of time after, between when you uh, move in and settle in in your room and when the uh, welcome begins and capping happens between 3 and 3.30. We will provide you with some opportunities to remain engaged at that time. And I'm working on that list. You, it'll be given to you when you arrive on campus. Uh, plus, that would be a good window of time for you to make any last minute uh, errand runs, if you know you forgot something, Target is about, I don't know, six, seven miles from here. You, you could stop and pick up whatever it is that you might have forgotten. Uh, please wear comfortable shoes, check the weather. It is usually cool in the mornings and evenings, and the afternoons in August can get pretty warm. Uh, you will be um, walking around maybe going up some steps. So be very comfortable uh, in your shoes. Um, we will have a shuttle 
will running that will go from parking lot to parking lot and up to the rest halls. Uh, if you're trying to get back to your student because you were the driver and drove away, please look for a shuttle. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a black and it's called Napa Wine Tours. Um, and they will be able to get you to your location. Um, I will uh, once again uh, be putting some links in chat for um, ID photographs. I'm still only 79 into the 262. Uh, transcripts, uh, which Larry will talk about. And I have that um, link, Larry, that I can put in, in chat. Uh, we're also looking for health forms. I have that link as well. I'll start putting the, all of these links in. We're doing the best with uniform uh, sizings. But and if your student hasn't done that already, uh, I will put that link in there as well. Um, moving quickly to housekeeping, please keep your devices on mute. And um, as you hear what our presenters are sharing with you, please put your questions in chat and I will field those um, at uh, the end when we open it up for Q&A. Uh, presenters, I uh, request you to please not answer stuff in chat because it becomes a little bit more tedious for me to get to the questions if the answers are in between and not everyone is able to see the answers. So hold tight till I start reading the questions and you can uh, respond verbally to those. Um, and if anyone who's unable to type in because you're driving or for any other reason, you're unable to type in your question, we'll open it up at the end uh, to get your questions verbally. Thank you presenters for being here. Um, after um, Larry has shared what he needs to, I'll request Saul to take um, the lead for financial aid and then Judy to take the lead for student financials. I talk too much. Um, welcome and uh, take it away, Larry. Well, hello all, I'm Larry Martin. I'm a manager in admissions and outreach. And I just wanted to stop by just to have you remind your students that there are, a, as we've been mentioning, a variety of action items they need to complete before classes begin. One of those is ensuring that they have submitted their final high school and community college or other university transcripts. Those were actually due back on July 15th, um, and they are needed in order to finalize admission and to ensure timely course registration and, and uh, financial aid disbursement. So, um, we really need those transcripts that they've not been sent. Um, we will be starting to call students to remind them for those that have not done so. So if you could, and we'll continue to send email reminders to the students' Cal Maritime email account. So the best thing you can do is just check in with your students, see if they've sent their transcripts. And if they have not, please encourage them to check their Cal Maritime email. We have instructions on how to do that um, because we want to make sure that we can finalize their admission and we can... Uh, get them registered in classes, which will start next week. So that's my big reminder, uh, transcripts, and continue to check that Cal Maritime email for updates. Um, and please answer their phone if we call them. If they see a 707-654 number, pick up and uh, listen, have chat with us so we can share what information we still need from them so that they're ready to, uh, to join us here in a couple of weeks. Um, and if they have questions or they're unsure, they can always call or email our office, the admission office. We're open every day from eight to five. Um, and we have students and staff here to provide support. But just wanted to make a quick announcement and then look forward to seeing you all uh, on move-in day on August 17th. Thanks so much. Thank you, Larry. Um, I am beginning to put these links in there so, so that you have them. Um, and always reach out to us at or me at orientation at csum.edu if you have any follow-up questions. But with that, Saul, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Benita. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Saul Ramirez. I'm the Director of Financial Aid here at Cal Maritime. Uh, together with uh, Judy and Frank, I will let them introduce themselves um, shortly here, but we have some present a short presentation actually for you. Um, and then we'll be able to take some questions, answer those questions, uh, maybe a lot of anxiety on around financial aid. What am I getting? How do I use it? What am I supposed to pay? Um, so that's technically what we're here to talk about today. 
Um, but I will let Judy and Frank introduce themselves really quickly. We'll bounce back and forth, but the presentation has information on both of our departments. We work very closely with each other. Um, so we will interject uh, here and there throughout the presentation. Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Judy Aguirre. I'm uh, from Center Financials and Cashier's Office and Concur Travel, um, but I'm the only one in the Cashier's Office and we work alongside uh, financial aid and uh, my accounting manager, Frank, is on here as well. You're on mute, Frank. There we go. I'm an accountant, not a technician, so there we go. Yeah, I'm the accounting manager here at Cal Maritime, and um, the financial services department is uh, kind of oversees the, uh, the the billings and the uh, the payment systems uh, that uh, for the students and uh, the um, the access that we have that you have through the um, <clears throat> through our uh, transact payment systems. So. Any any questions in that regard will follow through uh, to us. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Judy and, and Frank for that. We also have one other actually staff member representing financial aid. So she's in the audience today observing, but you may actually uh, talk to her, have already talked to her potentially. Her name is Cora Manuel. Um, so she helps uh, uh, with financial aid and a lot of customer service and scholarships for the time being. I uh, just wanted to throw that out there that uh, if you ever were to call our office, visit us, um, she may be another representative that you could potentially be be talking to. So with that said, with those introductions, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and start the presentation. Let me know if you are able to see it. And, oh, how about now? No? Yep, I think something happened. It was, something it was almost there and then it went away. <laughs> I was afraid that was going to happen. Let's see. Uh, nope. Uh, okay, let's try something else. How about now? We, yeah, it worked. Okay, cool. We did something right. Um, so let's talk about the agenda, what we want to uh, try to deliver today. So these are our objectives, again, between student accounting, cashier and services and financial aid. Um, I will be talking about financial aid process, how to apply. Hopefully you've already applied, but in case you haven't still wondering if maybe is it too late, is it not too late, I will show you which application to complete and where. We'll talk about the cost of attendance, how much does it cost to attend Cal Maritime. Uh, we'll talk about how to access the your bill, um, how, how much are you paying and for what are you paying, as well as the financial aid on the student portal. Um, Judy and Frank will talk about payment plans as well as refunds, how to get that extra money if there is extra money left over. Um, and then I'll finish up here by talking about an important policy that students are required to me, which is the satisfactory academic progress. We'll talk about what that requires students to maintain throughout their career in order to um, their educational career in order to maintain financial aid. Uh, and then a few important dates and things to remember as we wrap it up. First thing I want to talk about is I, I mentioned that we work very closely and collaboratively between the two departments. Um, our area is financial aid and Judy and Frank work under financial services or cashiers. So we both deal with money. Um, the only difference is I joke that financial aid gives the money and financial services takes the money. Uh, so there is sometimes a confusion or students don't know where, which office to go, which could cause potentially delays in getting an answer or some frustration. So I want to clarify that for financial aid, like I said, we give students the money. So we um, try to help students in applying for financial aid 
Uh, we provide information on the different types of financial aid, the re different resources, grants, loans, scholarships. Um, if there are additional forms that students have to complete, we guide students through that process. Obviously, we determine their student aid eligibility after they complete the FAFSA application. Um, and we also help students find scholarships. It, sometimes uh, students apply for FAFSA, uh, but they don't qualify for grants. So they may only qualify for loans and they're seeking additional financial resources. We can guide students on how to apply for additional grants to help them cover the some of the expenses that the university will charge them. And then on the opposite end, financial services, they handle all payments. Uh, so students have questions about how do I make a payment? Where do I make a payment? Um, I'm having trouble with payments. Um, they would contact financial services or cashiers. Um, any refunds, if students are expecting money back and they haven't received it, um, they would reach out to them. Um, what other, uh, at the end of the year, there's, this is an important one. There, you may be looking for a tax form. That tax form is for educational expenses. Um, and it's the 1098-T. Students have access to this form online. They can re retrieve it electronically. But if you're wondering or the student is wondering why I haven't received it or why am I not eligible, um, cashiering services will be able to help you with that question. Frank or Judy, anything else you'd like to add or that I might have missed or forgotten? Oh, yes, uh, we also handle the installment payment plan, which we will discuss later on in this presentation. Thank you, Judy, yes. <laughs> All right, so really quickly, like I said, you hopefully you've already applied for financial aid, but if you haven't, it is not too late. Um, California does have a priority deadline. It's a state deadline. Um, and that one unfortunately did pass. So if you have not applied for financial aid, you can still fill out the FAFSA, but you would miss out on state funding. So state dollars because of that deadline that the state has set. And that was normally it's March 2nd. Uh, there was a big change and overhaul to the FAFSA process. And there were a lot of hiccups um, and technology problems. So department or the state of California actually pushed that date from March 2nd to uh, May 2nd, um, initially to April and then May. So the final priority deadline was May. Um, that means that students would not, if they haven't filed and they're filing now, which they still can, they would miss out on um, like a Cal grant or middle-class scholarship, but only for this year. Next year, if they apply in time, they can still receive it. However, for everything else, federal dollars like a Pell grant or even just loans, students can still apply for financial aid. And they would either do the, the FAFSA application, which is here on the left-hand side. And this is for students who have a valid social security number, are US citizens or permanent residents. Um, they're eligible if they qualify to receive federal, state, and institutional dollars. Um, that QR code, if you were to scan it, if you haven't done so, it would take you to the landing page for the FAFSA application. However, if a student does not have a valid social security number, or maybe they have a valid social security number, but it's for working purposes through the DACA program or a deferred action of childhood arrivals. Um, they're not US citizens, they're not permanent residents, um, whether they're DACA or undocumented students, they would fill out the DREAM Act. They could still qualify for financial aid, but only for state dollars, not for federal dollars. Um, and that QR code will take you to that application. So if maybe you know somebody or son or daughter starting, but they haven't applied and they're not a uh, US citizen, they don't qualify for FAFSA, perhaps they may be eligible to apply through the DREAM Act application. Well, let's talk about the cost of attendance. How much does it cost to attend Cal Maritime? There are um, different cost tables, uh, depending on whether the student is in a let's say California resident, a non-resident, or under the WUI program, or WUI stands for WE, um, Western Undergraduate uh, Exchange Program. Um, what I'm showing you here is for new students starting in the fall that are California residents. Um, and there are three columns. So you have the on-campus column. The middle column is for students living off-campus and for students living with parents or relatives. 
So Cal Maritime is an on-campus uh, housing institution for the most part, although there are exceptions, um, depending on whether the student graduated from a high school within a certain radius here or the student petitions to live off campus for um, reasons that are listed on the housing uh, website, rather. So there are reasons why they could petition. But I'm going to focus on, because we are an on-campus institution, focus on the first column, which is on-campus um, cost of attendance. So students would be looking at the tuition charge, of course. And these are annual charges, by the way. So this is fall and spring. It does not include summer, but it is fall and spring. Um, tuition charge. So these are just the classes. Uh, it costs them roughly about $3,000, a little over $3,000 per semester or for the year, $6,000. Um, if your student is starting in the fall, they won't have this charge on their account yet because they have not been registered for classes. So after the 29th, when they start reg uh, getting registered for classes, they will start seeing this charge posted to their account. Um, there are campus-based fees, um, about $800 per semester or $1,600 for the year. There is a one-time uniform charge fall semester only. So this charge is only for fall. Um, they don't get charged again, unless for some reason they need to replace our entire uniform. Um, highly unlikely, highly, highly unusual. Um, but if they do, they obviously there is another charge down the line. For the most part, students just pay that one time uh, for their uniform. There is an orientation fee. The medical insurance um, is a charge. Students are required to have medical insurance. Um, so they can either uh, have it through Cal Maritime here, or if you already have them under your medical insurance plan and it meets our requirements, you can waive out of that. It's not through cashiers, it's not through financial aid. You, there is a process and a form that to be completed, and that's on the student, um, student health center page. Um, but it, again, you can waive out of that and not get charged the $1,600 um, for housing and food. You living on campus, it is $14,000, a little over $14,000. So these are the charges the institution is going to charge you and what we call direct expenses. Everything after this is what's called indirect expense. Um, so the institution is not going to charge you for books, uh, transportation, or personal expenses. That $1,000, $1,400, $2,400 respectively that you see on there, uh, we are still required to provide you with an estimate of how much students have spent in the past. So you can uh, estimate how much uh, additional money you may need um, in addition to the direct expenses that the institution is going to charge you for. So when we look at the direct expenses that we talked about, your tuition, campus-based fees, uniform, housing, food, et cetera, plus the books and supplies, transportation, personal expenses for one year, you're looking at roughly $3,100. The student, excuse me, the student could potentially save some money on books and supplies. Maybe they won't end up paying $1,000. Let's say they borrow a book or share a book from a, a, a peer or they buy it on Amazon used instead of new. Um, transportation, same thing. If they're living here on campus, they're probably not going to be uh, having a big budget or needing a big budget for transportation. Um, this is mostly for if they have a car, maybe budgeting for gas, if they're going to be paying for insurance, car insurance, budgeting that in there. Um, but if they don't have any of that, um, you could probably knock off either $1,400 or maybe uh, at least $1,000. Um, same thing for personal expenses. We think that students may need $2,000 for personal expenses, you know, going out maybe on a weekend trip with friends or, or things like that. Um, but if the student does it and, um, and they know how to budget accordingly and not spend too much money, perhaps you'll also be able to knock down a uh, thousand or two thousand dollars off that. So the actual total cost of attendance may not end up being 31,000, maybe perhaps closer to, I don't know, 28, 29 thousand dollars, depending on, on how much they're able to save on some of the indirect expenses, which are the last three there. Um, the estimated loan fee is not an actual cost, um, but it is something that is deducted from the uh, loan when students borrow. So if students borrow, I don't know, $100. Um, actually, that's a bad example because it's a percentage, but let's say they borrow $5,000. 
there, there is a loan borrowing fee of roughly average about $58 that will be taken off that $5,000. So they will only be getting the difference in their hand. But again, that's not an actual cost. Uh, we do have to include it in that cost of attendance. Um, so that's what a cost of attendance looks like. It is different. Like I said, it's not on here, but if you scan that QR code, it has the other categories. It is different for students who are out of state. They do pay uh, a higher uh, tuition amount. Um, for the most part, all the other charges are the same. And then um, Western undergraduate uh, students also pay a little bit more, uh, more than the in-state amounts that you see on here, but less than non-resident students. Now let's get into, now that you know how much is it going to cost, if you haven't already, this is where you would go, actually the student, or you would need their student username and password, but the student uh, would go in to view their financial aid, their charges, um, and sign up for a direct deposit or any items that they need to, um, to do on their end. So first they would go into www.csum.edu and then click on login on the right-hand side and then PeopleSoft Student Center or Student Systems rather, sorry. And then click on Student Center here. Oh, it is out of order. <laughs> that Student Center box. Uh, that was out of order. This is where students would click next once they log into the system. Again, they'll need their username um, and password, not yours. You don't create an account. This is all for the student. Um, so they will need to log in here. Of course, if you have that information, you can log in um, for them. Once they are here, um, this page is very important. So there's a lot of information here. Upper right-hand corner, you'll notice this one has college transcripts required. Larry was talking about this earlier. So if a student does need to provide that information, it would be listed on here. If financial aid needed any documents or any information, we would list that on here. Um, that section, you can't see it, but um, I cropped it off. Uh, apologies, it wasn't on purpose. Right above that, it says to do box. Um, so this requires a student to take action. Um, if they don't know what the college transcript required is, they can click more information here and it gives them a little bit longer explanation on who needs it, by when, um, what to submit, um, or where to submit it to. So that's one area. The other is the blue arrow there is pointing to account inquiry. This takes you to see a, a summary of uh, the student's bill. Uh, the green arrow is pointing to view financial aid. Um, I'll show you how to get there and we'll click on that. Um, right below that, I don't have it on the screenshot because I don't have access to it, but right below that view financial aid would also be one that says accept decline financial aid. This is for if you have loans and you would like to accept them, this is where you would click right below that view financial aid. Again, it's not shown in here, apologies. Um, but it, it is only for loans. You don't have to accept or decline grants that are offered to the student. Those are automatically accepted. And then, of course, um, on here, you also see the account summary. So this will show you um, the overall amount due, uh, future due in this case is $11,000. Uh, we'll talk in, and get into a little bit more detail about the uh, orange uh, arrow here, account activity. Uh, this is where you would go. It's a drop down menu and you would click account activity, which will show you per term um, what exactly is it that you're paying that $11,000 for? So here, um, the next slide, I went back one, but if you were to click on that green arrow, which is view financial aid, the next screen will take you to uh, the academic year that you want to look at. Um, if you're a student starting in the fall, and obviously they will be, they will only have one year to click on, which will be the 2025. As they progress, they will have access to more years so they can see each year's financial aid. Um, of course, in, in this instance, we're interested in how much a student would receive for 2025. Um, so they would click on aid year 2025, which would will then lead you to the screen on the, on the right here, that box. Your financial aid or your student's financial aid 
um, could look something like this or completely different. You may have more or less financial aid. Remember, loans are part of financial aid. So you see loans listed on here in the middle. Um, the category tells you what type of aid is being offered to the student. In this particular case, they have work study that is being offered to them, $2,000 for the academic year. This is something that the student needs to work for to, to receive that. So their salary comes out of this federal grant that is given um, to the student. There is a federal Pell Grant that is given to the student. It says it's a grant. The following two are loans, federal loans that the student does have to accept. You'll notice they're not accepted. The grants are, but the loans are not. That's because they have to go back to this previous screen and imagine there is an accept button right below view financial aid. That's where you would click to accept the loans if you wanted to, if, or if the student wanted to accept them. Um, and then the others are also grants. So this, this particular student is getting CalGram B fees, CalGram B, which is a different component to different amounts, as well as state university grant, the amount listed on here. So all together for the year, we're offering the student $24,000, including loans. But if they don't take out the loans or without accepting the loans yet in grants, um, including work study, they are being, um, they would receive $18,000. The bottom here, uh, red box is per semester. So we break that up in two payments, one in August and one in July. So per semester, the student is being offered, it's the same categories, um, only divided by two. So one semester in August, they are being offered, or for the fall semester, they are being offered $12,000, including the loans, but without the loans, $9,100. So in August, that's how much we would release. Mine is a 1,000 because they have to work for this one. So we would release $8,100 in grants. We would release that and apply it to outstanding charges that the student may have. I'll turn it over to Judy to talk about those charges. Yes, thank you, Saul. To see the details of the charges, um, it will be on under other finance information account activity. Uh, you can see the charges, payment, and refund. So right now for first year students, uh, they only have the housing, dining, uniform, and orientation charges. Once they are enrolled in classes next week, the other tuition and fees will show on their accounts. And so there is an extended due date for the first year students of August 16, and another billing statement will be sent out as well. So I will provide on the chat here a link for more information on uh, the tuition and fees for each semester. Let me go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so for payment plans, Let's say uh, the payment cannot be made in full by August 1st or for the first year students, August 16th, uh, our campus offers installment payment plan. There is a $50 administrative fee to sign up for the plan. And so the first payment is due August 1st, uh, which is a third of the balance plus the $50 administrative fee. And then the next installment is due September 15th. The last installment is due October 15. So I will also provide in the chat the link to the installment payment, payment plan webpage, and you can find the form on this link as well. So for refunds, uh, financial aid disbursements will be on August 12th, and anything that financial aid, uh, for example, if it's more than the balance on the student's accounts, um, any credit will be issued as a refund, either by direct deposit or a physical check. And so here is a QR code. And if you don't have access to the QR code, I can also drop the link on the chat um, on how to enroll in direct deposit. Do you have anything to add here, Silva? That's it. Okay. Um, actually, perhaps I do. I'm going to go back a couple of slides here. Um, and 
to essentially those instructions that Judy was talking about will take you back to here. So this is where it's it's found. If you can see it right under my account, under the finances section, it is enrolled in direct deposit. Perhaps we can make that a little bigger. Um, so it's right below that blue arrow, account inquiry, enroll in direct deposit. That's where bank account information, account routing number will be provided. Faster, easier if students are expecting a refund, especially during the summer when they are away um, at sea or international experience abroad and may or may not have access or fast access to their refunds, um, direct deposit goes straight into account. Otherwise, the deposit gets mailed, so it'll go to the mailing address to the student. Go back to, Judy, was there anything else here? Yep, that's all I have. Awesome. So let's talk about this important uh, policy that we are, students are required to maintain. We're required to notify the students um, that they have to meet what's called satisfactory academic progress or SAP for short. So in order for students to continue to receive financial aid, the federal government has said that students must meet the three requirements that are listed on here. Um, and that is a GPA. So as undergraduate students, they are required to maintain a 2.0 cumulative GPA. So we're not talking about the term GPA. Um, we are talking overall academic performance. As long as students keep above a 2.0 cumulative GPA, they meet that requirement. They are also required to maintain a certain pace. Pace means that they are passing uh, a certain percentage of the classes that they attempt, and that percentage is 67%. So of the classes that they sign up for, they attempt, um, they must pass 67% of those. They don't have to pass all of them, and that's okay, and they don't have to pass them with an A. Ideally, hopefully they will. Um, but uh, any grade that results in a, an F, an incomplete, a W, they withdrew unauthorized withdrawal. Any of grades that is uh, considered not passing is what we're looking at. And as long as they um, they are above 67%, they will also meet that requirement. Once they get into maybe their fourth year, fifth year, um, they will start to um, have a certain number of units that may be reaching the maximum time frame or what we call the maximum time frame, and that's their overall units taken for their degree. Um, we do give them an additional 150% above the unit requirement. So for example, if their major requires 120 units, we expect that they finish in 120, um, but not everybody does. So we give them an additional 60 units um, before they, uh, fail at this category, if you will, the maximum time frame. So if they reach 120 and that's where they should have graduated, but they're not, it's okay. Maybe they retook some classes. Um, maybe they have a, a minor um, and they're at 130, 140 units. They will still be fine for financial aid purposes. Once they get into 180 um, or above, then that means they will not have um, past the maximum time frame category. Um, and it's it's not, if they fail one of them, it, it means their financial aid will be held. There is a process. Um, this we don't run, we run at the end of the spring semester. I'll back up and say that. So every spring semester we will look at, and that's at the end of the academic year, we will run the student's academic performance and review, did the student have above a 2.0? Did the student pass 67% of the classes? And have they reached the maximum time frame? If the answer is yes, 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 they're good. They will continue to receive financial aid all throughout, no issues. However, if a student does not have, let's say, a 2.0, but they have a 67% and they haven't reached the other one, well, that will prevent the student from receiving financial aid moving forward. But we give the student an opportunity to appeal. So it's not the end of the world. However, we want to make sure that we connect the student with the appropriate resources. Perhaps they need um, tutoring, academic advising, um, maybe psychological advising, I don't know, other resources available to the student depending on the situation, but we give the student an opportunity to appeal. And that appeal, we wanna know why didn't you pass 
or yeah, why didn't you pass 67% of your classes or why didn't you have at least a 2.0? Students can come back and say, you know what, I was working too much. Um, those hours were uh, taken away from my studying and I was just failing. However, now I know and I, I am no longer working or I'm cutting back my hours. So we wanna make sure that we know what the issue was and what the student is doing to make sure it doesn't happen again. If it's a matter of, I just, I took this class and it was really hard and I can't seem to pass it and it's bringing down my GPA every semester, then we wanna connect them with some resources here on campus. Um, so we'll work with them on that as well. But as long as the student appeals and it gets approved, then they will continue to receive financial aid moving forward. Um, of course, until they, they no longer meet it again at the next run, which would be the next semester. A couple of uh, important things to remember that students have to reapply for financial aid every year. So every year, traditionally the deadline has been March 2nd. Um, try to stick to that deadline unless the state uh, pushes it for some reason. This year, like I said, they did push it to May 2nd only because there were some technology issues and FAFSA changes and, and whatnot. Um, but for the most part, um, March 2nd is the deadline to apply, resubmit their application. Um, students should check that PeopleSoft Student Center. Uh, on here, I, I put on a weekly basis, but at least maybe once a month in case there's things that are added from our department or another department on things that students will need to take action. So it's a good habit to, to get into. Um, the other thing is that for financial aid, at least the, our formal and main main way of communicating with students is through their CSUM or CSUM email account. So they are assigned an email account here, student account. That's the uh, the main way where financial aid will reach out to them, ensuring that they regularly check it, that they don't ignore any emails. I know they're bombarded from all areas with a lot of emails. Um, some of them, perhaps they can just scan and realize, oh yeah, this doesn't apply to me. Perhaps it's an event that they're not interested. Um, but if it's something like, hey, you owe something, you, you have a balance past you or financially, financial aid needs some information, um, perhaps something that they need to pay attention or close attention to. Um, if the student does want to or need to withdraw for whatever reason in one class or for the entire semester, best to talk to an academic advisor first, as well as financial aid, um, to determine will this have an impact on my financial aid that I will receive in the future or that I am receiving this semester? Will I have to pay anything back? Would be a, a question that as a student, perhaps they would need to be asking if they are thinking of withdrawing um, from some classes or all classes at any semester. And then lastly, some important dates that I listed on here. So we will release financial aid for the fall semester on August 12th. That means that after August 12th, we will go ahead and give that money to Judy and Frank and say, this student is receiving $12,000. Take whatever it is that you need for their tuition, for their room and board, pay their charges. And if there's money left over, issue them a refund. Um, if there isn't money left over and you still have a balance due, then you will have until August 16th to pay that difference. We do have Cal Maritime specific scholarship opportunities. They should open up. Right now we're aiming for late November, maybe cutting it closer to December perhaps. We will notify students. There's a marketing campaign letting them know to apply. So encourage students to apply for scholarships. This is in addition to whatever they would qualify for um, with their FAFSA. And then also reapply for financial aid October 1st. This is when the federal government is aiming at opening the application. Last, this past year, they didn't open it until um, December 31st, from January 1st, let's say, because of the FAFSA changes and technology issues that they had. Um, but they're trying to go back to the regular cycle, which is October 1st through March 2nd. So pay attention to any emails from Department of Education, from our office, reminding students to apply. We also hold virtual and in-person FAFSA workshops. So if you and or the students need help by, uh, filing, filing the FAFSA or renewing the FAFSA again, um, that you uh, attend one of those workshops, virtual or in person. We don't have the dates yet, uh, but once we do, and once that's finalized and planned out, we will send that communication out to students. Um, and then looking forward into spring semester. So spring, 
um, starts in January, um, but just a heads up, financial aid won't disperse until around December 30th. Um, and that's when we will then pay uh, spring charges that will be posted by them. Lastly, our contact information. So you have financial aid, you can reach us uh, via email or phone. Um, same thing for cashiers uh, listed on the right-hand side, financial services. I think that takes us to Q&A. Wow. Thank you so much for the detailed PowerPoint. Um, if Saul you feel comfortable sharing, um, sharing this um, PowerPoint, I can place it on our webpage so it's available to families to look through. Um, I just wanted to let this group know that I've received a couple of emails uh, asking whether orientation is on the 17th or the 14th. I am still quite unclear where the 14th date is coming from. I did look through our website and I found that there is an academic calendar that states that the fall semester begins on August 14th. That's generally speaking how the semester starts when the faculty gets back and how the employment is set up and those are the details behind that date. But orientation when we're expecting students to come and start their orientation program is August 17th. That's move-in day and 18, 19, 20 is the orientation program and first day of instruction is August 21. If you have any questions related to that, please send them to me at orientation at csum.edu. Um, I will, uh, ready. are you guys ready for questions? All right. Uh, the first one I see in my, um, as I go down, yeah. Do I understand correctly that incoming cadets with missing transcripts will receive an email at that C at their CSUM address? Uh, I do believe Larry said that, and I know that we've been sending a lot of communication regarding myriad of issues uh, of uh, for paperwork and such, and that is being uh, sent to their CSUM email. Um, next question. Has family weekend been confirmed for October 5 and 6? It has been confirmed and it's October 4 and 5, which is Friday and Saturday. Um, this session is being recorded. I'm very apologetic for missing the recording piece last time. Um, now, um, is there a parent's income limit to apply to financial aid for US citizens? Parent income limit. So good question. Um, the FAFSA application will ask a lot of questions and they get very personal questions from how much did you make? How much savings do you have investments? Um, what your tax bracket, how much taxes did you pay? So financial aid is not solely based on how much did you make? All the questions that you answer on the FAFSA um, go into a formula to determine financial aid eligibility. It is a misconception that students or their parents will say, we made too much money, $150,000, $200,000. We won't qualify for anything. That's not necessarily true. I would encourage you to still fill out the FAFSA application or the DREAM Act application and let the federal government or the state government, let them tell you, you only qualify for loans, which is worst case scenario. You get loans, it's type of financial aid, but you say, no, thank you, I'm not interested, I could pay out of pocket. Best case scenario is, even if you think you made too much money and you didn't qualify last year, but this year there's new rules, new regulations like the FAFSA, it's a brand new formula uh, intended to give more grants to students, especially Pell Grant. Um, so every year, even if you're only getting loans, Renew your FAFSA application um, because you never know uh, what the state or the federal government has changed and you may receive um, a grant. Um, so to answer your question, there isn't a limit. There isn't a limit where I can tell you if you made over 100,000, don't even bother because that's not true and that's not the case. Even if you made 150, 200,000 or more, I would still encourage you to apply for the FAFSA. Um, 
Also because in the past uh, with COVID, there was emergency funding that required students to have filled out a FAFSA um, to, in order to receive some of this funding. Um, and there were students who had not filled out a FAFSA because historically they had not received any type of grant. So they were just getting loans. Um, but here comes this grant. Yes, it was a, a special historical um, thing that happened with COVID. Um, and hopefully not something like that won't happen again. But if there is money out there that requires that you have filed a FAFSA and you don't have one, you're excluding yourself automatically from it. So it doesn't hurt um, other than perhaps spending an hour or, so, or maybe less filling out the FAFSA, um, but I encourage you to still complete it. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I need the name and address where the check should be mailed by the bank which handles the students' uh, college funds. And they need to mail them directly to the college. Yes, I will drop it on the chat, uh, but for those listening online, uh, the address is California State University Maritime Academy, Attention Cashier's Office, 200 Maritime Academy Drive, Vallejo, California, 94590. On the memo section of the check, please include the student's first and last name with the student ID number. Thank you. Um, also, just, Benita, really quickly, can I, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, so they were specifically asking for um, 529 college savings plan, but it also applies for scholarships. So if students are expecting um, to receive outside scholarships and they wanna know where to send those scholarships, it's the same address that Judy um, is going to drop in the, the chat. Thank you. Uh, my son will be a buoy cadet. Can you comment what's expected if CSUM and SLO integrate, merge? We won't know any of that. Those are details that are unknown at this time. Uh, so hang tight. Once we get there, there'll be, there, there will be FAQs and more instruction and guidance for how we're handling things. Um, Is, is this extra money for travel and personal expenses directly given to the student? So there isn't extra money. What we do is um, for financial aid purposes, we take that cost of attendance, that $30,000, and we say if the student needs $30,000, we rely on FAFSA to tell us what the student is eligible for, and we just take everything that they're eligible for and we give it to the student, not to exceed $30,000. So no student is gonna receive more than their cost of attendance. I'm using $30,000 as an example. Um, if you remember that table, cost of attendance table that, um, that I shared, the middle column was for off-campus and that was over 30,000, so $37,000. Um, so it, it's the cost of attendance specific to the student, the maximum amount of financial aid that they're getting. Um, now, let's say the student is only getting $5,000, $2,500 for the fall, $2,500 for the spring in a grant, but we saw that their tuition is $3,000. That means we will apply the $2,500 to tuition and the student is responsible for all the other charges, including travel, including uniform, including uh, housing, meals, et cetera. On the opposite end, Let's say the student is receiving uh, $15,000, and that's for one semester. We take that $15,000, we give it to Judy and Frank and say, pay their tuition, which is $3,000, pay their mandatory fees, pay their room and board, which is $7,000. Um, so if it's everything is covered in that $15,000 and there is $1,000 left, the student gets $1,000 and they can use that for travel, for gas, for whatever else that they need it. If the university is not charging you for it and you have a, a, a student gets a refund, they can use it for anything, personal expenses, books, travel, um, or save it. Maybe they need it, they might need it for the summer. You never know. They can put it into their bank account and leave it there. Thank you. Is there an additional fee for summer cruise? 
Yes, uh, there is uh, an additional fee of 4,105 for the summer. Um, I will go ahead and also drop the link for more of the summer C term on the chat. I'm a student. I noticed that I have the middle class scholar grant on my award ceremony. It says it's offered, but I can't accept it because it says it has been accepted on my behalf. Should I expect to receive the listed amount? That's an awesome question. Thank you for asking that. So there are some students that receive that middle class scholarship in offered status, not accepted. The reason for that is we were waiting for the state of California to finalize the state budget. Um, and when we send out the communication to students that they were receiving this um, particular type of award, uh, it was, I think, bold and, and perhaps capital letters that it was a provisional offer um, subject to change. Uh, what that means is that that middle class scholarship could potentially be changing now that the budget has been signed. Students, um, for the most part, should expect to receive the amount that they see on there, but there are going to be some variations as students would be receiving less than the amount that is listed on their account. Uh, once we have the final amounts from the state of California. Cal Maritime does not determine the amounts, does not determine eligibility. We rely on the state of California to give us those amounts. So what the students have and see is what the state of California initially told us students would be getting um, before the, the budget was signed. Now that they, it is signed, they will give us the actual amounts. We expect that to be after school starts. So most likely um, early September, maybe middle September. But once it is uh, approved and we have the finalized amount, we will add it to the student's account. We will remove the wording on, on the, the posting. Right now, all the awards say estimate, estimate Pell Grant, estimate middle class scholarship. Once all of those are finalized, we will remove the estimate. It'll only say middle class scholarship and it'll be offered and accepted. You won't have to accept it. It's free money. The only type of awards that students will have to accept is the loans. Thank you. Um can I start paying my son's student loan prior to him graduating? You sure can. There is no prepayment penalty. You can start paying at any time. Just know that the federal government is not going to send the student a bill or the parent, if it's a parent plus loan, a bill. Um, well, on the parent plus loan, you can defer it until after graduation. Yes, otherwise it is um, payment starts right away. But on the subsidized or unsubsidized loan, you can start paying it anytime. You just have to be proactive and take initiative into contacting them or making that payment only. Thank you. Um, when will the student center be back up? I'm not clear what they are meaning by that. Are you talking about the building? Um, Gabrielle, if you could give me a little bit more detail as you... Um, I'll, I'll read it back up again as I go down. How do we enter the uh, amounts of payments on the installment plan form if we haven't been billed for tuition and other fees? So when the student is enrolled in classes next week, uh, they can go on to Student Services Center and under account activity, they can see the other charges listed there or you can call the cashier's office and we can walk you through filling out the installment payment plan form. Thank you, Judy. Um, this might shed some light on the previous question. Um, what are the math and QR placement and written communication placement holds on my student center? So you're talking probably about PeopleSoft uh, Student Center. Uh, I'll have to check. Do any does anyone on the call know anything about these placement holds? Cora, maybe no. Um, why don't I check on that, uh, Jeff, uh, for you? If you can uh, just copy and paste this question in orientation uh, email, I will follow up and respond uh, to let you know what's going on. Does my son have to fill out an authorization to release info uh, form in order? for me to make his payments. Judy? No, the authorization to release information is only when a parent has a question regarding a student's account. And if they are listed on the authorization to release information, we can share the details, um, but it's not needed to make the payment. 
Uh, this is related, Judy. Can the parents get into this portal to pay versus having the student do it? Yes, uh, so the parent can log in to CashNet. Um, I can also provide the link in the chat. Um, and the login is the student's ID number. And then the password is the last four digits of their social security number. Thank you. Um, when is the first tuition meal plan, et cetera, due for the fall? For first year students, uh, the tuition and fees, including the housing and meal plan, is due on August 16th. When I went to make payments for the ho for housing, I found my scholarship was already applied as a deductible. However, it didn't take anything off the total cost. Is this a visual glitch or am I missing something? If that parent can uh, give me a call tomorrow, um, I can review the account with them. So uh, the cashier's office number is 707-654-1031. I'm uh, adding that to chat, JP. So JP is a student who has been attending the session. So please wait for a, uh, look for a call for him. Um, gotta go back. How to apply for FAFSA. Let me go ahead and drop that. I um, will put uh, one second. It is studentaid.gov, and I will put that in the chat right now. Okay, thank you. Does the funding from VA educational benefits work the same way as financial aid? Will it post uh, August 12th? Uh, so that is a good question. I, it, it's a different process. It doesn't go through financial aid. There is a certifying official. I can put her contact information here. Um, let me just drop the studentaid.gov. So that's in the chat now for students to apply for the FAFSA. Going back to the VA benefits. So Shari is our certifying official uh, here at Cal Maritime, not within financial aid. She's with the registrar's office, um, but she can give you more information. You It does potentially require an application depending on the, uh, or a request for funding, depending on the, the source of the benefit. <clears throat> um, accounting, cashiers, and Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, once um, it has been certified by Shari, contact information is in the chat now, but once it has been certified, that information goes to cashiers and they usually post it right away. Um, so it doesn't get um, delayed until the 12th or a future date. Uh, it doesn't wait for financial aid process to go through either. Yes, that's correct. So, so <clears throat> it's um, when the certifying officer, Shari, sends that to the cashier's office, it's usually applied the same day or the following day. Does that, thank you, thank you. Uh, what address would I mail checks for payments? Uh, that's the same address that Jude, uh, Judy put in the chat already. I hope <laughs> you'll find it, JP. Um, and he also wants to know if there uh, is some sort of list of eligibility I can use to see if I would be eligible other than filing the form, or filling the form list of eligibility um types of aid is that uh if you're asking for types... sorry go ahead so um like at the beginning of the year my mom and i were trying to do the fafsa and there was a lot of technical errors so we kind of just gave up and just went with the assumption that she makes too much money we're not probably not going to get anything out of it and we just kept on writing that assumption so is there a way we can look up like theoretically if we would make something before going through the effort there isn't um unfortunately they changed that formula um it used to be prior years they had an efc so i could tell you once you fill out the fafsa it gives you an efc or if this efc um was above a certain amount perhaps i could tell you what you would be eligible or not eligible for 
Um, but even with that process required you to complete the FAFSA to spit out that EFC for me to tell you whether you would be eligible for or not. Essentially, I could probably tell you now there it's a new number. It's called the student aid index, but it still requires you to go through the process to get that number so that I can get an idea of what you might be eligible for. Thank Great. you. Next question. Do you have a rough idea of charges that will uh, happen after we start classes that are not showing up on the bill now? So when the first year students enroll in classes next week, uh, that will be usually the set charges, um, but it's up to the students if they decide to drop a class or enroll in another class, uh, there are fees associated with the class such as the Math 101 book fee, there's an art fee. So it depends on the classes that the students will enroll in. Can I add one more thing? So uh, in addition to those, so there may be, you should have your tuition charge on your account by the time school starts. You should have your housing, your meal plan, um, a series of campus-based fees, uh, which are roughly like $800, $900 total. Um, so those are the fees that you should expect on your account. Um, what Judy's talking about is if you add a class later that has a lab fee or an additional component extra charge, then that will be added after the fact. The other charge that will be added after the fact is if you choose to do a single room buyout. So that's an additional charge. Let's say you don't want to do a double, you want to do a single and there's the space for that. That charge, if you see a charge on a housing account right now, it doesn't include that single buyout. Later, we will, cashiers will get a list that'll say charge the student an additional 1500 or however that single uh, uh, buyout is. Those would be the only charges that you would expect after the fact. As long as you have your tuition, campus-based fees, room and board now, room and housing, or housing and meals, um, you should be for the most part okay. And you should be looking at roughly about $13,000 or so. That may be 11 to 13, somewhere around there. Thank you. Um, what do campus-based fees and orientation fees specifically include? The campus-based uh, fees, I will include on in the chat um, what each one covers. Uh, for example, there is the campus document fee that covers the issuance of the ID card. And so there are different mandatory uh, fees. So I will put that in the chat here. And then for the orientation fees for the first year students attending orientation on August 17. And if you want to share more details about that video. So yes, orientation fee includes all the, the delivery of the curriculum for the four days and the move-in costs. Um, and that's what makes the $385 because we are preparing a curriculum for them for those four days. And that all adds up. So that's specifically, that's what the, that fee is for. Um, but the other fees, like the health fee and the athletic fee, recreation fee, those are various fees and they have their own purposes that I wouldn't know too much about. Um, can you please speak to the uniform costs? So do we want to address this? Uh, I want to recognize that we are over and we have 12 more messages to go. So basically, um, uniforms is something that we'll handle next on 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 Thursday uh, next on next Tuesday, the thirtieth. So if you can hold tight on that, we can answer those uniform related questions later. Um, do loans charge interest? Loans do have an interest. Um, it is on um, an annual basis. So those loans are locked in for this year. Um, if the loans change again next year, if those are uh, increased or decreased by Congress, then perhaps every year that the student takes out a loan could have a different interest rate. Um, but those are not determined by the institution or by the state. Those are uh, Congress, their federal loans um, and students are required to do an interest counseling and a promissory note um, before we give them the loan money. That way they know what the interest rate is on those loans for this year, how to repay it back, when to repay it back, what happens if they can't repay it back, loan forgiveness programs. So there's a bunch of information and tutorials and um, um, 
that are required from the student before we give them the money. But there is interest on those loans. Some of them, some of the loans, like the unsub, unsubsidized loan, will accrue interest right away, whereas the subsidized accrues interest later once the student graduates. Can I say real quickly, Vanita, there was a question about accessing the student services um, mm -hmm. when we weren't sure about the building or the website. Uh, it does look like Cora was looking into it from uh, off campus. I am on campus still, and I'm trying to access the student PeopleSoft student system, and it's down for me. Um, so it does look like it might be down across the board for everybody. Um, I would imagine IT is working on it. So as soon as keep either refreshing later this evening or tomorrow refreshing to access the system, um, because I'm having the same problem. Thank you. Um, I did make a notation to find out what's going on with that. So. Uh, it, it's probably a system problem, not a campus problem. Um, is the 500, I'm sorry, is there financial aid available for summer cruise? If so, when do we apply for summer financial aid? Great question. There is financial aid. You do not have to apply. There isn't a separate application process. Essentially, what we do for the summer is we look at how much money do we have available left over from fall and spring? How much do students have left over from fall and spring? And once they register for the summer semester, come March um, or next year, once they start registering, we will start looking at how much money do we have available to give to those students. We use the FAFSA from this academic year. So we still go back and say, um, let's see what they were eligible for for fall and spring. Can we give them an, or match the same thing or can we give them more or less? But that's why it's important to have a FAFSA um, on file as well. But there is no separate application process. Thank you. Is deposit fee of 500 going to credit to the fees uh, or was it an additional cost? The 500 admission deposit fee includes the housing deposit of 150 and the uniform deposit of 350. So these will apply to the housing charge and the uniform charge. So one one parent or one person on um, the call says they didn't notice that uh, deduction. Could um, Angra, could you possibly send us, uh, reach out to Judy at 1031 uh, to look further into that, please? Uh, her number was in is in the chat. Thank you, Judy. Uh, and then, where do we find the authorization forms to fill out so that uh, I can access my student's account and have full access? Who wants to take on FERPA? I can drop the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, just so you know that um, those authorization forms are completed by the student, signed off and sent to the campus. And they have, uh, they have to do separate ones to get um, billing information, health information, academic information. There's uh, different forms. You ha they have to provide those waivers uh, to the campus. Should we wait until total charge shows final amount to request bank with college funds to mail check? It's optional, but um, yes, you can wait until all the charges are showing on the account. Um, if the VA award hasn't been certified by August 16, do we need to pay the amount and then wait for the refund? So if the VA award hasn't been applied yet, uh, yes, if you can pay for the amount and then the refund will be given once the VA certification is applied to a student's account. Thank you, Judy. When and how do students enroll in classes? Sal, do you want to take that? Want me to answer? Go for it. So all uh, incoming freshmen are going to be uh, block registered. We're waiting for all the transcripts to be evaluated and the Office of the Registrar will block register once we know what courses your student is eligible to take. And that will happen between July 29th and August 10th. Uh, once that's done, that's when the tuition fee will show up and you're ready to make your payments. Um, Sean, thank you. Uh, someone said that students should add parents somewhere so parent receives requests for fees. 
Um, yes. So you need to, Judy, you want to take that one? Yes. So um, also on CashNet, uh, the, the parent can also add their email address. That way they can also receive the billing statement. It looks like we've gone through the questions. We did stay over. Apologies for that. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters for staying extra long today and then going over our promised one hour call. Thank you very much for being here. And um, if there are any other questions, I'll stick around for a little bit longer. If there are any other questions, I'll take them down um, and have a reach out to you guys. So Frank, thank you. Thank you, Saul, Judy, and Cora. Have a wonderful evening. And I'll stick around for the families if they have any follow-up questions. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you, Benita. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any follow-up questions? Um, let me talk a little bit through the um, uniform questions that the question that was asked earlier. So all the students who are in majors that are not related to a license, they had the option to join the core. If they chose to join the core, they would be, uh, they would have seen in their in their billing uh, a full uniform um, cost of I think eighteen hundred dollars. Those who chose to not join the core they would have to follow a dress code, which is a much smaller ish, a uniform issue or dress code issue of um, polo shirts and a jacket. And those students will be, um, will be wearing those with a pair of khaki or black or tan pants um, and footwear is open and they're not required to have any headgear. Uh, so the costs for the two are different. Your uh, financial aid packet, was built on your selection, whether or not you wanted to be uh, be a part of the core. I hope that helps. Uh, all the students who are in an engineering program or DEC program um, must, an FET must um, fall into the core. Am I good to call the number? Yes, JP, you can call. Uh, uh, Judy at 1031. Not today. This is, uh, she's already staying past uh, her five o'clock uh, work day. So call her tomorrow. Um, I have a random question not relating to finance. Do transfer students reside in upper res? Um, transfers, uh, we try and put transfer, transfer students in McAllister. Um, Sean, wait till you get your email uh, from housing. And if you're not in McAllister, shoot them back something saying you'd like to be in uh, the other uh, res hall. Not related to today's topic, but do you know if a safe is allowed in the dorm room? You can bring whatever you want into your dorm room. Be mindful that there is limited space and um, and you know you want to be mindful of not taking up more than your half of the room. And if you want to utilize your floor space with a with a safe, sure you have to bring it up a bunch of stairs and all of that good stuff. But something that is not on the uh, not to bring list, so you're good. Um, and TVs are not allowed to be hung on the wall. They'll have to be on on a stand. Uh, what is an FJT? Um, I'm not sure what where you saw that. Um, do the pants need to be dress pants? Uh, you could wear any pants if, if you are not part of the core, as long as they're black, tan, or khaki. Um, are the placement uh, tests the same as test testing. Good question for when you meet your academic folks. Uh, I don't want to give you the wrong response. Question about athletics. I got in touch with cross country coach a few weeks ago, uh, but they haven't returned your call. What is the deadline 
there isn't a deadline. You will be meeting all the uh, coaches um, when you get here during orientation. I think the cross-country coach is David Ward, and he might just be on vacation. But I'm making a notation for David to reach out. Uh, Jeff, sorry, not uh, David Ward. Jeff Ward. And I will have him get a hold of you, JP. Um, deadline for health forms is July 31, I believe. So get them over there as quickly as possible. I'm going to give Irina a chance to ask her question. I saw her raising her hand. So hold, um, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I did. Thank you so much. Um, I was not clear on this answer, how to add the parent. I was not clear. I, I'm okay. the one who asked it and, uh, Okay. I, I can get it. So to get added, you you still need to work with your student. There's something called CashNet, and all students have a CashNet account. Your student needs to get in there and add your email into their account. So when they get a billing email, your email will also get that same message. Okay, so he just needs to add my email. Correct which right. is different than calling us and asking us about financial questions for which your student needs to uh, file a form giving us permission to speak with you, which is a FERPA form. And he can research that in, on our Where web. is the form? Where is the it form? It will be on, online or it, he can get one here. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Absolutely. Um, I'm not so sure, JP, if there's a CashNet link on the Cal Maritime website, but just put CashNet in uh, the search uh, field and you'll find out. I have an ROTC question as to how does one get to Berkeley if they don't have a car? So if you don't have a car, you'll get to know other ROTC students who are traveling there. Somebody will have a car and you will form that community. And I know that uh, people carpool, they work with uh, the program and find a way there. If you don't find a way, it, it'll it be tricky because getting to Berkeley is not going to be easy from here. But I've never heard, um, I've never heard of someone who was unable to get there because you, you form a pretty strong community um, with the, our, the other ROTC students. Uh, I'm trying to get a parking pass exception for his ROTC. Jenny, you should be able to get it. Just uh, follow the uh, directions from the parking uh, web page. And um, I was informed that they are providing passes for, for first, first year students. Uh, let me find that um, link where they ask you to... Um, fill out the paperwork. Give me a second. Um, Jennifer, didn't we, we, we've exchanged emails. Can you send me this request via email and I will respond to you with the exact link. I, I'm not seeing it right now. Uh, but I know it exists. I'm probably not doing the right search. And I'll email it to you. Okay. I found it. Follow um, the, the information on this page and... Um, They'll, you don't need to email them. Just follow the directions from this web page. Um, I got something in Q and A. Do we shop around for loans? Are there other loans offered? Are the loans offered the only ones available? That would have been a great question if I'd seen it sooner. I'm sorry, uh, Angela. Um, for Saul, if you can email it to email me this question at orientation 
at csum.edu. I will go ahead and get that question over to Saul and he can respond. All right, we have 21 strong, 21 people going strong. Let me know if there are any other questions. If you wanna unmute. All right, looks like we're good for today. We will yeah. see you on the 30th. Oh, there's someone, yes. I was having trouble getting it to unmute. Oh, um, no, no worries. So I'm wondering, it sounded like um, there was a cap where they no longer qualify for um, financial aid if they go over a certain number of credits. Did I understand that correctly? I've never heard that, uh, but your financial aid can be impacted if you do not get enough, uh, if you don't pick up enough courses. So too few courses will um, will have an impact on fin your financial aid packet, but too many I've not heard of. But uh, if you will be so okay. kind as to send me that question at orientation at csum.edu. Okay. Um, yeah, I will forward to Saul and have the, the right person respond. Okay, thank you very much. How do you say your name? Is it Rachel? Rochelle. Or... Rochelle. Thank you, Rochelle. Yeah. I'll look yeah, for no you. Yeah. Okay, thank um, you. You're welcome. Uh, first year students, I, you know, uh, I'm finding some clarity on that. It looks like we have enough space. So we, uh, on a case by case basis, are giving out permits for to freshmen. However, we want you to be mindful about making that request. If you see a very specific reason for them to have a car so they can leave the campus, you know, then you must do what you need to do. However, um, if they have a car, they lose out on a full experience, campus experience. Um, so be mindful of the reasons why you're requesting one. But yes, if you go to that parking, uh, link that or web page that I, that I just uh, included in chat, you can request a consideration. Uh, you can't pay there. You can uh, follow the instructions to get approved for um, approved for a permit is my understanding. You can't pay there. Once you've been approved, then you can go ahead and pay the cashier off cashier's office directly. Well, it says to email parking at blah, blah, blah. And we did that. And then, okay. th then they said uh, the link, but the, they sent us the same link, which it doesn't have anywhere to, to pay. And they said you could call the cashier, but it's still very confusing. So did you, uh, did I get, uh, Provide the right um, web page where you followed the instructions. I don't think so. Oh, you don't. I just I just clicked on your link, and it's the same page that we've gone to in okay, the past. Okay, so we are we're talking about the same place, but not getting anywhere. So let me follow up with uh, PD and um, Jet. Is that how you say your name? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Of course, we have emailed and then tried to okay. follow the email and that didn't work. So okay. it's okay. not very easy. Could you put your email address in chat to just me and then I will take it down and um, find out what's going on from uh, PD and um, get back with you. Jenny also uh, has the same question. Um, so why don't I do this? Uh, why don't I talk this talk about this at the next um, at the next session so I can give you the answer. Okay. I'm making a note. I'll get the answer by the thirtieth. Thank you for your patience on that. Jen. Thank you, Jet. All right. Thank you, Jenny. All right. If there's anything else, let me know. I'll give it 
10 seconds. Uh, August 10th is uh, when we should be block registering you. Thank you for the heart. Um, and then once they're here on campus, they might, once they look at their schedule, they might uh, decide after talking to their faculty or their advisors that they want to make some changes. So I think it'll be uh, up until early September. I don't have the exact date, but up until early September when they can switch their classes around. Um, and let me see if there is something that I can find. Last day to add, uh, drop a class, September 4. So they should be able to add, change, drop, any, any of those things can be done. Um, but if it's just a matter of swapping, they should be able to do it during their orientation days. They'll have little breaks here and there to be able to pull that off. But do we get roommate information the same day? We, uh, yes, you will get one email from housing that'll say who your roommate is, um, any other information they provide, as well as your move-in slot time. That's my understanding. But again, those guys are going to be meeting with you on Thursday, August 1. So they'll tell you all about uh, your roommates and um, your campus life information. Okay, it's 7.01 and um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being um, such great partners with us in the success of your students' arrival here. Uh, we'll be ready and uh, they will be in good hands. So worry not, we'll see you on next Tuesday. I, keep, I can't even keep up what day it is. Today's Thursday, we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a wonderful evening. Until next time, bye-bye.